Good morning, my dear family in Christ. It's very nice to be with you this morning and to, um, to speak with you. Whether you're here in this place or with us through the miracle of technology online, old or young, my words are intended to provide something for all by God's good grace. This morning's thoughts are centred on themes of forgiveness, restoration and loyal love. Simple concepts perhaps, but somewhat more challenging to truly root in our lives. Psalm 85 verses 1 to 3 sets the foundation upon which the psalmist's prayer and our thoughts this morning are based. It starts with an acknowledgement of God's great acts in times past. In the form of the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Verses 1 to 3 says, O Lord, you showed favour to your land. You restored the well-being of Jacob. You pardoned the wrongdoing of your people. You forgave all their sin. You withdrew all your fury. You turned back from your raging anger. Showed favour, restored, pardoned, forgave, withdrew your fury. Verbs that demonstrate God's very active involvement in both the individual lives of his people and in the life of the nation as a collective. God made a deliberate choice to reach out to his people and have a positive relationship with them. In spite of the grief and the hurt that his people had caused him, God showed mercy and love and patience and kindness. Verses 1 to 3 is a literal history of forgiveness and restoration. Forgiveness and restoration. God's restoration was as great a gift as his forgiveness. He brought his people back from the brink on many an occasion, restoring them in his love. His love was enduring. His mercy was boundless. As we prepare ourselves for reconnecting with Christ through the emblems this morning in remembrance of him, let's apply God's enduring principles of forgiveness and restoration to our own thinking, behaviours and actions. It is inevitable that we will experience grief and hurt on more than a few occasions in our lives. It's a factor of the human condition. Regardless of your age, whether at school, tertiary studies, at work or at home, I'm sure all of us can call to mind examples of that hurt. Perhaps some friends at school are intentionally or unintentionally unkind. Perhaps you had a parent or close family member constantly criticise you as you grew up. Maybe a work colleague sabotaged a project or someone close to you betrayed your trust. Or maybe you've had a traumatic experience. These wounds can leave lasting feelings of resentment, bitterness and anger and sometimes even hatred. And that anger and resentment might manifest itself in an avoidance strategy or an inherent active or even passive aggression towards that person or group. The Bible has a few things to say about holding on to those feelings. In James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, James writes, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. Let every person be quick to listen slow to speak, slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. How often do we take the opposite approach? We are slow to listen, we are quick to speak, and we're quick to become angry. When someone takes a different position on an issue or they do something that we don't like, the barriers go up. And we rarely take the time to listen to that alternative position or to hear their side of the story. There's no way we're able to step out into their shoes because we're filled with self-righteousness, not God's righteousness. Pride, not humility. We rush to anger and judgment. 
We might talk about them to others. We might give them a piece of our mind. Social media might receive a rant. As followers of Christ, James provides a better way to respond. Be quick to listen. Take the time to hear the other person's perspective. Listen to their story. Allow them to explain their actions and do so without interrupting. You may find that you still disagree, but you can disagree in a way that honours God and is commensurate with his laws for our lives. As James reminds us at the end of verse 20, human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5, from verse 21, Matthew writes, You have heard that it was said to an older generation, Do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with a brother will be subjected to judgment, and whoever insults a brother will be brought before the council, and whoever says fool will be sent to fiery hell. We're judged by our anger and our insults. Anger and insults that manifest themselves in either inward expression as much as outward expression. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on the cause of your anger. Have you ever wondered about that interesting statement, be angry and do not sin? Does it seem to be an inconsistent statement? Perhaps you're wondering how, how can we be angry but not sin? And there's a key distinction we need to understand first. The difference between righteous anger and sinful anger. We can take example from Jesus' life. We have recorded examples of the overflowing of his righteous anger. In Matthew 21, Jesus was angry when he threw the money changers out of the temple. In Mark chapter 3, he was angered by the hypocritical religious leaders of the day. At its core, Jesus' righteous anger was targeted towards offences against God or other people. There are no recorded examples of him becoming angry due to personal insults or personal mistreatment, and he endured much. Peter says in 1st of Peter chapter 2 that when he was maligned, he did not answer back. When he suffered, he threatened no retaliation, but he committed himself to God, who judges justly. So instead, Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Where does your anger usually stem from? Injustice against other people? and offences against God, or small personal offences or mistreatment. When you are maligned, do you answer back and seek to defend from a position that comes so naturally to us, that position of pride? When you suffer, physically or emotionally, do you seek retribution? thus the example of Christ. Version, verse 3 of our reading, God withdrew his fury. He turned back from his raging anger. These are strong, powerful feelings. Fury, raging anger. But God chooses love and forgiveness. Forgive and forget right? We may forget trivial wrongs, but deep hurt will be remembered. And actually, forgive and forget is not a biblical instruction. It's not found in the word of life. What the Bible does say is love keeps no record of wrongs. And I don't think that means that we must somehow artificially erase those painful events from our memories but rather that our feelings of hurt and anger are converted by love when we forgive. We work to love in spite of those events. The answer to hurt and anger is love, 
and forgiveness. And forgiveness leads to peace and hope. In verses 5 through 7 of that same psalm, the psalmist appeals to God that he might forgive, restore and revive his people. Will you stay mad at us forever? Will you remain angry throughout future generations? Will you not revive us once more? Then your people will rejoice in you. O Lord, show us your loyal love. Bestow us on us your deliverance. Sound familiar? Forgive us our sins, deliver us from evil. The psalmist's prayer for revival implies that the nation was once alive, is now dead, and was in, ni- in need of revival with new spiritual life. Just like CPR for the body, the psalmist prayed for renewed life for his nation and his people. When we forgive, we can experience a personal restoration and revival as we let go of our ill feelings, literally the feelings causing us to be ill, and press on instead toward the goal with a spirit of peace, love and hope. As Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians, brothers and sisters, I am single-minded, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching out for the things that are ahead. With this goal in mind, I strive toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness doesn't happen by accident. It's not organic. Forgiveness is an intentional act we make a deliberate choice to let go of our anger and our resentment. Sometimes forgiveness may lead to feelings of empathy, compassion and understanding for the person that committed the wrong. In Matthew chapter 5 at verse 23 we read, So then if you bring your uh, your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your gift. Reach agreement quickly with your accuser while on the way to court or he may hand you over to the judge and the judge hand you over to the warden and you'll be thrown into prison. And even the world acknowledges the positive effects that flow from true forgiveness. Healthier relationships improved mental health, less anxiety, stress and hostility, fewer symptoms of depression, lower blood pressure, a stronger immune system, improved heart health and improved self-esteem. So what gets in the way of forgiving others? And why do some people find it or seem to find it, so much harder to forgive than others. It's true that some people are naturally more forgiving than others. But even if you do tend to hold a grudge, you can learn to be more forgiving. Being hurt by someone, particularly someone you love and trust, can cause anger, sadness, confusion. If you dwell on hurtful events or situations, grudges filled with resentment and hostility can take root. If you allow negative feelings to crowd out positive feelings, you might find yourself swallowed up by that bitterness or that sense of injustice. How do we learn to become more forgiving? Well, as Christians, we have a wonderful gift in prayer. Prayer can help us to open our hearts to forgiveness. Within the framework of prayer, you could acknowledge your anger and resentment and recognise how those emotions affect your behaviours and your decisions. You could identify what healing, what needs healing and who you want to forgive. You could choose to forgive the person who's offended you. As the lyrics to a well-known song go, nobody said it was easy. True forgiveness can be hard, especially if the person who hurt you doesn't admit wrongdoing. But getting another person to change isn't the point of forgiveness. 
Forgiveness is about focusing on what you can control in the present, right here, right now. Try walking in that person's shoes or think about the times that other people, or even God and Jesus, have forgiven you. Think on these things as we try to emulate our Father and our greater brother Jesus' acts of forgiveness and restoration. Remember that you are a child of God, a child of God with a special commission. You must put away every kind of bitterness, anger, wrath, quarrelling and evil, slanderous talk. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Ephesians chapter 4. In verses 6 through 7 of Psalm 85, the psalmist appeals to God that he might show his loyal love by forgiving, restoring and reviving his people. This concept of loyal love is a common theme, appearing many times throughout the psalms. The psalms speak of God's loyal love enduring and his loyal love filling the earth. And often his loyal love is linked with his other characteristics of faithfulness and mercy. These sentiments are also reflected in our second Psalms daily reading, Psalm 86, where it records, But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and merciful God. You are patient and demonstrate great loyal love and faithfulness. Verses 10 through 13 don't only look forward to the implementation of the psalmist's request for forgiveness and restoration and deliverance, but actually visualise its appearing. It says, loyal love and faithfulness meet. Deliverance and peace greet each other with a kiss. Faithfulness grows from the ground, and deliverance looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will bestow his good blessings, and our land will yield its crops. Deliverance goes before him and prepares a pathway for him. Beautiful, poetic words that describe the certainty of God's deliverance, stemming from the fertile ground of his loyal love. Our other daily readings from today also confirm the certainty of God's faithfulness and his deliverance. The consecration of Aaron and his sons as priests in Exodus 29 point us to God's plan of deliverance. And our third reading of Mark 14 records God's deliverance in Christ Jesus' surrender as the lamb that was slain. Jesus sacrificed all in submission to his Father, and our Father God sacrificed his most beloved Son for the deliverance of mankind. And very soon we will remember him in this meal laid before us. These readings give us such great clarity and confidence in God's saving hand and his certain plan for restoration and revival of his creation. The earth will be filled with his enduring, loyal love. A new heaven and a new earth, a holy city and a holy people. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.